Even though Final Fantasy XV has now released and sits like a wonderful trophy in my completed games pile, I actually keep having to pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. But yeah, it does seem as though Hajime Tabata achieved the impossible. After 10 years, he managed to steady the ship and get Final Fantasy XV to stumble over the finish line. And it's not a train wreck. In fact, it's actually pretty good. Now, don't let my jovial optimism fool you. There are some devilishly dark and evil parts of this game that counteract the sunshine and roses. And as we run through this review, I hope to detail all of that out in a clear and concise manner. And in my customary format, that means I'm going to be splitting this review up. However, unlike my last review, I'm actually going to be adding a chunk, which means there's going to be five sections, story, structure, gameplay, presentation, and lasting appeal. Feel free to skip between the sections at your leisure, but I'd recommend you listen all the way through to get a full flavour of my experiences with the game. Also, fear not, this review will be predominantly spoiler free as I know how horrid it is to have things spoilt for yourself. Heck, in the three weeks surrounding the release and fallout of Final Fantasy XV, I actually put myself in a nice vacuum protecting myself from anything relating to this game, and I mean anything. If you want a similar experience, which at this point would be pretty hardcore if you've managed to maintain it, then please check this review out in the future. Anyway, enough with the formalities, Final Fantasy XV is here and I'm about to review the heck out of it, so strap yourself in because it's time to get this show on the road. Oh, and if you enjoy this review, please be sure to hit that big old like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright, story. Final Fantasy XV is, in a nutshell, about Noctis, Lucis, Calum and his quest to reclaim the throne of Lucis. However, it doesn't start that way. Your first interaction actually takes place in Chapter 0 with Noctis, Ignis, Gladiolus and Prompto getting flamed in the face by a mysterious being for about 5-10 to 10 seconds. Then the game jumps to them pushing a broken down car for what seems to be actually a much longer period of time. Compared to what we've been used to in the past, whether it be the opening bombing mission in Final Fantasy VII, fighting Garland in the original Final Fantasy, the attack on Sanctum in Final Fantasy XIII, or the dramatic scenes that see Bash branded as a traitor in Final Fantasy XII, it actually felt like quite a tame introduction to the game. Thankfully, that wasn't representative of what would follow. Anyway, I digress. After being ushered out of the Lucian capital by King Regis, Noctis and his friends are on their way to Altissia to see that he marries Luna Freya and Nox Florey, and this plays out as the initial part of a developing plot that, in truth, does end up feeling a little bit disjointed. Let's be honest though, the development of Final Fantasy XV's story was perhaps one of the most controversial in video games history. I can't think of another example of a game that's had major story details announced only for them to be changed almost entirely later down the line. But that's the reality of Final Fantasy XV and it meant that there would be a lot of eagle-eyed people looking for any kind of slip-up or inconsistencies. For me, the important thing about this transition was that the creator of the original narrative, Kazushige Nojima, was part of the decision-making process and had approved the proposed changes. Hajime Tabata was quick to point this out when the core changes were announced, and it gave me more confidence, especially given Nojima's pedigree. I'm not going to skirt around these issues here though, as there are some significant gripes to be had with the game's story. Despite there being some great moments throughout, parts of the narrative we were led to believe would exist just didn't materialise. That's not to say the story would have been better if they'd been there, but I guess we'll never know. For all the good, bold risks that Tabata and his team took with the story, from character defining moments through to even world changing moments, there are niggles. Niggles that make you think about what might have been had there been more time? I mean, in reality, I honestly don't think more time would have solved anything. The issue is that it feels more like a Franken story. It's two stories that got merged into one and some things just don't mesh, they fall by the wayside. I mean, Tabata had to try and retain as much of what was already announced as possible, but craft it into a new story that he wanted to tell. It was a difficult task and I did not envy him. On the whole though, I was satisfied with the story they actually presented. Some parts of it were awesome, but the Franken story I mentioned creates a hollow feeling that just follows everything around. And the main disappointment here is that this hollow feeling was primarily due to Square Enix themselves and how they pushed things in our faces throughout the game's development. This isn't just dating back to the old Final Fantasy vs 13 days either. I mean, characters were announced and given roles in pre-release material that suggested much larger roles within Final Fantasy XV would be forthcoming, but they weren't. In some instances, it's been so bad that Square Enix has had to issue a statement proclaiming that they will be creating and patching new scenes to help give more context to certain characters. In other instances, we've had scenes that introduce what should have been massive plot points, but they just end up being really inconsequential pieces of information that they never go anywhere with. And there are other areas where they just basically ignore things that happen in the story because they'll instead be covered in upcoming DLC. I will say though that Noctis, Ignis, Gladiolus and Prompto are good characters. In my opinion, Noctis and Ignis are the best developed out of the quartet and I really enjoyed their adventure, and condensing the party down to only 4 members meant that things didn't quite get as diluted as we saw in Final Fantasy XIII, and I think it was the right decision. I couldn't even fathom how they would have dealt with more personalities in the group on a consistent basis. 
I mean, guest members actually provide a nice balance to things, even if they only stay for a very short period of time. I think this was a good decision. And it's safe to say that Noctis will go down as one of the better Final Fantasy protagonists. I just can't fathom how Ignis did so badly in this poll that Square Enix put out. I'd question how many people even played the game. Have a heart, damn it! Arden, who is often the key that allows the quartet to progress, is also a strong character filled with mysterious charm. And he brings me onto a part of the story that I enjoyed the most. The fact that it kept me guessing and actually made me a bit uncomfortable at the same time. I'm not just talking about random plot twists that you don't see coming, I'm talking more about the blurred lines that are presented. For example, most of us know that Arden is the bad guy, I mean he's the Chancellor of the Niflheim Empire, so why is he helping Noctis and his friends? Each of his actions just keep getting more and more puzzling as you progress, and it isn't until right at the end of the game when you're finally ready to actually make a decision on how you feel about this guy. And even then, despite everything you've learned, you're still left with mixed emotions as his plight does warrant a degree of sympathy, perhaps more so than any previous villain in the history of the franchise. And it might sound strange, but I actually enjoyed the fact that the game made me feel. And I'm not just talking about the typical feelings we'd associate with a Final Fantasy game, the gushy romance, the feelings of loss, or the desire to take revenge against the bad guy. I'm talking about other feelings. I mean, there were a few times in the story I genuinely felt pissed off and angry at one of the protagonists because he was being such a jerk, and you just don't get that kind of emotional response in video games that often. And that's what I mean about Final Fantasy XV's story. When it's good, it's really good, driving you through a mix of different emotions. But when it's bad, it's just so obvious. I mean, if you compare one of Ignis' character-defining moments to that of Prompto's, they aren't even on the same level. It's just a shame they weren't able to give all the characters the same treatment, as the cast as a whole had the potential to be quite a special one, and it deserved better. Outside of Noctis, Ignis, Gladios, Prompto and Arden, who I would consider the core cast of the characters in the game, Luna Freya would be next on the billing. It might sound a bit harsh that I place her lower on the spectrum, but in the context of the story, her footprint on the game isn't actually as strong as those five. It's safe to say that I therefore expected more from her as a character. I mean, her relationship with Noctis actually seemed quite straightforward as opposed to this complicated one we were promised when she was announced. I just genuinely hope they're able to expand more on her story in the future. Other pre-announced characters do have roles in the story, but many of them arrive in a diminished capacity. You will talk to these characters and interact with them, but there aren't that many who actually leave a lasting impression in terms of their actions. As individuals, characters like Kor, Iris, Sid, Cindy and Aranea are distinctive and they're recognisable. But in relation to the story, I don't think you can say the same thing. For example, and apologies if this is a tiny spoiler, but it really bugs me that aside from looking at a picture and hinting at things, Sid's past with Regis, Westcombe and Claris is essentially just ignored. They gloss over it at every single opportunity. It would have been so cool to hear Sid talk about the parallels with the current main cast and reminisce. Instead, he essentially just says he hasn't talked to them for years and chose a life of seclusion. He regrets things and that's fine, but it's just too superficial. And before you say that's what a King's Tale is for, no, it's not. It's not even canon. I guess I'm saying this more out of frustration than anything. The cast of characters, as I said, felt like they had the potential to be really special, perhaps more so than any Final Fantasy game in history. I don't know if this is just the influence of all the pre-game buzz, but for me, it wasn't ever just about the protagonist. They had crafted meaningful characters who could support Noctis and his friends, and I wanted to learn more about them. I wanted to feel the same way I did about characters like Bugenhagen and Fujin and Raijin. The only character who I felt was given this kind of treatment was actually Talcott, and I appreciated that so, so much. Just the closure. It might sound strange, but his talk with Noctis towards the end of the game is one that will just stick with me. Why couldn't we get the same level of depth to Core, Iris, or Sydney? They're good characters, but they could have been great characters. I'm not so sure I can say the same thing about the quest giving NPCs. <laughs> there was clearly an attempt to give these guys some personality, but it really didn't work that well. I mean, Dino, bless him. He's a guy who for one does not look like he should be sounding like an Italian mobster. His introduction to the story actually worked well though. He's a journalist who had learnt about Noctis being outside of insomnia and also being alive. So he asked you to do him a favour to keep it secret. In the end, he looks to help you guys in return by getting you a pass on the boat to Altissia, but it falls through. It was actually a narrative that made sense, but the next time you speak to him and the many, many times after, it just becomes soulless. It's just the same fetch quest over and over with no real reason other than, well, just because. Anyway, it feels like I'm kind of getting on a negative head of steam here, so I'm just going to take things back to something positive. I mentioned before about world-changing moments, and it's safe to say that the world of Eos is a wonderful place for this story to play out. It just oozes personality, and even changes in subtle ways as the story progresses. Even though it does seem a bit frustrating at times, I love the emphasis they put on the night time. It wasn't just thrown in for the sake of it, there were actual story-based reasons for this to be present in the way it was. I'm just going to leave it there though, but I really enjoyed that part of it. In short, as you can probably tell, this story leaves me somewhat conflicted. There's parts that deserve a lot of praise, and thinking back, I do have fond memories, 
but there's also a lot that just makes me feel a bit confused and disappointed. I don't want to say that it's a complete mess, because it's not. Instead, I'll say it's like a trifle that has a few scrumptious layers. They just didn't add the right sprinkles on top, and they kind of forgot to add the jelly. Right, now that I've got that summarised, I think it's time to move on to the next section. <laughs> yeah, right, like you didn't think I'd talk about the ending. Now, I appreciate I might actually get a little bit of hate for this, but I thought the ending was kind of underwhelming. That's not me just sitting here sipping my Kool-Aid and acting like a super smug internet critic. I just felt like there should have been more of a resolution in the wider sense. I can't really say much more than that without going to full and spoiler territory. I do feel like I'm being a bit picky. I mean, I do genuinely appreciate what it offered. The scene around the campfire is one that everyone would always point to, and I've seen so many people saying they were in tears over it. I didn't quite get that far, but I do really appreciate the scene. It was a nice touch. But yeah, as I said, I just felt like it could have resolved a lot more than it did. Alright, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead, and I'm going to move on. Structure. This is actually quite a weird section, but I felt it was necessary to talk about the flow of the game and the questing system in general. I didn't feel as though it should sit within the story or gameplay, and in the sense I'm going to discuss, I didn't feel as though it would fit within lasting appeal either, so yeah, that's where we are. So as I mentioned in the story segment, unlike previous Final Fantasy games that often start with a huge mission or set piece, Final Fantasy XV took a much softer approach, and in reality, the game does take a bit of time to get going. This is for numerous reasons. I mean, there's obviously a conscious decision made here from a storytelling perspective, but it's also coupled together with the new, let's say, westernised mechanics that are in play throughout when it comes to progression. Square Enix heard the complaints about linearity loud and clear. Final Fantasy XV is therefore very open world and non-linear. Sure, there are some invisible barriers that are put in place due to the story, such as the Imperial checkpoints, etc., but the map is massive and the world, as they say, is pretty much your oyster. For me personally, I didn't really like how this was implemented, and before you start grabbing your pitchforks, please let me explain why. I'm not a massive fan of open world games like Skyrim and Fallout. I mean, I enjoy them and can appreciate them for what they are, but despite being a completionist at heart, in those games, due to the sheer volume of quests and distractions that pop up, I'll generally get to a point where I just get fed up with them and try to progress with the story. And that's fine, because there seems to be an infinite number of things that can distract you in those games, so I can continue knowing that I can come back to it later. I mean, the main story is ultimately the reason why I enjoy playing RPGs, so I want to experience it. The issue I have with Final Fantasy XV's implementation of this mechanic is it makes you feel guilty for taking this approach. Often, when you want to progress with the story, you will be presented with a message asking if you're sure you want to continue because you might not be back for a while. It might not seem like much, but this passive-aggressive message made me then feel like I needed to complete every single available side quest before I progress with the story, which brings me on to the side quests themselves. You might think that you have three side quests left to clear, but when you turn those side quests in, the same quest vendor will give you a near identical quest again and again and again. Taka gave me so many quests I lost count in the end and there was so little story or motivation for doing them that I just kind of got burned out. Dave's dog tag quest could have been so cool, offering up some kind of unique mission and enemies so that you could learn about the person whose dog tag you're collecting and the fate they met. I mean, isn't that the whole point of you getting the dog tags in the first place so that people don't forget these people? Yet they don't tell you anything about these people aside from the fact that they often got killed by a random bunch of weak monsters, which is kind of underwhelming. The strange thing is that even though there was no real incentive to do these quests aside from menial items and experience, I just couldn't block them out of my mind because they were also so straightforward and simple to do, and I therefore felt guilty for not doing them before I progressed as I didn't know when I'd get the next chance to do them. The majority of them are literally get quest, go to location, fight monster at location, return to quest giver. You actually probably spend more time fiddling around with your travel arrangements to and from the location compared to actually doing the quest itself. Don't even get me started on those stupid find the objects in this designated area quest. Ugh, I'm getting sidetracked here. My point is that on top of the already slow progressing story, you have the doldrum barrier in your way called side quests. If you don't do them, you'll likely be underleveled, so you just get sucked in, and for me, this kind of ruined the flow. I probably wouldn't have had an issue with this if many of the side quests were like Dino's initial quest, where there's a clear story motivation, but the majority of them don't even have that correlation. And I'd prefer it if the game didn't pester me if I wanted to progress. If you want to make the game open world and accessible, why not just keep it that way? It frustrated me that this conundrum existed because in many ways it's no different from how we used to have the grindy XP in the olden days. The addition of side quests is supposed to mask this and make it more interesting, instead it just replaced it. You're grinding emotionless quests as opposed to grinding monsters. Once I hit chapter 9 and left this all behind, I genuinely started to enjoy the game a lot more. Apologies if that section was a bit negative, but for me, the whole passage after Kyan just felt liberating and I do appreciate that that's kind of ironic given how the game changes at that point. I just felt like I was progressing at a natural pace without any pointless unnecessary distractions. If I wanted to go back and do side quests, I had the option thanks to Umbra, but if I didn't want to, I didn't have to. 
and there was no passive aggressive messaging telling me off or wanting to progress at my own pace. In a strange way, it kind of felt inverse from what I'd expect. With a Final Fantasy game, I'm used to travelling a restricted path with hints of wider things I can do, and by the end, I've worked hard to get to the point where all those hints are open to me, and I can explore and do everything I couldn't do before as a precursor to going on and being the crap out of the final passage of play. I just felt like I was given too much too soon, and I appreciate this might not be a common viewpoint. I mean, I've seen so many people who have spent tens of hours in the early parts of the game, and they're not exactly unhappy about it. But I just felt because of this approach, the structure just felt a little bit off to me. Perhaps when I play it again, I'll go in with a more focused mentality, attempting to progress with the story as quickly as possible despite the nagging in my head. But yeah, alright, let's move on to some gameplay. As pretty much everyone in the world knows, Final Fantasy XV started life out as Final Fantasy vs XIII, a spin-off title developed by the Kingdom Hearts team. Its combat was therefore always meant to be of the action RPG ilk, and after some modifications since then, it is now referred to as Active Cross Battle. It's obviously a huge change from anything we've witnessed before in the main series and represents a departure from the classic turn-based approach that has been ever-present in different guises. I think it's a positive change though. I mean, not once when I was playing did I think, damn, I really wish this game was turn-based right now. I mean, I enjoyed the fact the game had a lot of zip to it in the same way that I enjoyed how fast-paced Final Fantasy XIII was. Wave mode was there if I wanted it, but aside from doing a brief test, I just never even went back to it. I mean, when you boil it down, the combat in its current form is still rather basic. If you want to attack, you hold circle, and if you want to defend, you hold or tap the square button. It's that simple. You can also use a triangle to warp to a vantage point, allowing you to heal up fast from recovery MP. That's pretty much it. The strategy, therefore, comes from how you attack. Whether it's positioning yourself so you can perform a blindside attack, doing a warp strike from a large distance so you can break and stun opponents, or using link attacks and special attacks, there's additional depth there in terms of strengths and weaknesses of elements and weapon types, but to be honest, this felt more like it was a frill as opposed to a fundamental. I didn't ever once feel like I was being impeded by attacking an enemy with the wrong weapon type, which I guess is pretty bad. I just used whatever I wanted to and never seemed to actually struggle. Magic was also thrown in too, and it's pretty awesome when you use it, but I never felt like it was actually necessary in order to progress. For me, that's likely down to the barriers they put in place in terms of using it. You have to go through so many hoops from the crafting to the constant equipping and then even the actual process of using it in battle. And as weird as it sounds, the fact that I didn't have to rely on these things was actually a big positive for me. These elements are there if you want to enjoy and explore them, but they aren't fundamental. And it's something I appreciated. The game just felt pretty balanced however you chose to play. I mean, if you're horribly underleveled, you'll feel it but sometimes you could squeeze by if you had a decent stock of items and were resourceful when it came to the combat. Regarding the weaponry, there are actually quite a few different types to begin with, and I was genuinely surprised at the level of depth in terms of playstyles. If you switch from using a sword to a greatsword, you're going to feel it, and each has its pros and cons. The addition of the royal arms is also a nice touch. These are weapons that have more power and propose even more playstyles, but at the cost of draining your HP when an attack lands. This does lead me on to some of the points that I found a bit more difficult to get behind though, starting with the implementation of maximum HP. Basically, you have two health bars, an active HP and a maximum HP, and when your active HP reaches zero, you go into a down state where you can't do anything other than hobble around and use items. While you're in this state, it's your maximum HP that gets decreased, and not just when you get hit. It also goes down over time too, and if that hits zero, it's game over unless you use a phoenix down. This mechanic actually annoyed the crap out of me, perhaps more than it should have done. There were just so many frustrating parts about it. For one, literally as soon as you go into this down state, your maximum HP starts draining. If you've been on the receiving end of a hard attack that knocks you down, you might have lost a third of your maximum HP before you can even get up and have Noctis go through the process of using an item you've told him to use. So that's gripe number one, when you actually have things within your own control. The second gripe is if you don't. Should you not wish to use an item to recover yourself, you have to wait for your allies to rescue you. Why is this an issue? Well, you can't actually tell them to. You have to wait for them to do it of their own accord, and sometimes you might have even lost half your maximum health by the time they actually divert their attention to helping you. You can literally stand on top of them sometimes, and they will do nothing until they're ready. Thanks, guys. My third gripe is kind of related, in that sometimes you can be fighting so many enemies that you can't even move when you get down. They just surround you and pin you against the wall. It's therefore impossible for your allies to then revive you, so you have to use the items. I kind of get why they had the time mechanic in there, but it would have been so much better if they just penalised you for the amount of times you went to this down state as opposed to how long you were in it and how many times you got hit while you are in it. Let's say you got downed and revived, they could keep all the existing mechanics, but you would only lose 10% of your maximum HP when you actually recovered. I feel this would have been so much better than the current form where your maximum HP can get cut pretty much all the way down just by some bad luck. Your allies also aren't the best sometimes, and can fall into that classic we lack self-preservation mentality, especially if the odds are slightly out of favour. I felt they died way more than I did throughout the journey, and to be honest, aside from using link attacks, 
They might as well not have been there. I rarely paid attention to anything they actually did in combat, which is kind of a shame, but it's also an expected byproduct of an action RPG that has an autonomous party. These elements could have been a lot worse though, and outside of these gripes, I can't really find much at fault. Sure, sometimes you had no idea what the hell was going on and there were just waves upon waves of enemies coming at you, but it's kind of exhilarating at the same time. Outside of the core combat, I guess I should talk about the driving and why this wasn't implemented in a better way. I mean, what's there is competent, and sure, they weren't going for a GTA free-for-all go wherever the hell you want approach, but the whole thing is just a bit clunky. Like, why did they have to limit you to going 50 miles an hour? You're a damn prince with a beast of a car. Sure, you can improve the speed a little with modifications, but it's just painful sometimes. Auto travel is just way more awkward than it needed to be too. Why do you have to get in your car to do this? And when you're looking at the map, why is it so frustrating to read? It really does not need to jump around everywhere as manically as it does when you skip between locations. There are so many little things that just annoy me about the UI and this kind of thing. From the text being all white and therefore unreadable in certain instances. Like it's just, why was this kind of stuff in there? Anyway, this part of the review could last for a long time. So I'm just going to condense it into some quick fire bullet points. Combat, loved it. Weight mode, never felt like I needed to use it. Maximum HP system, not so thrilled. Parrying, very rewarding. Warp system, addictive. Element C, not fundamental enough for me to care. Weapon choices, love them. Armager, forgot I even had it most of the time. Enemy selections, great. Summons, awe inspiring, but aside from mandatory times, I think I was only prompted to use them about four times, so I'd probably go with a bit disappointing. Cooking, so useful and gorgeous looking, but it's way more beneficial not to camp, so sorry Ignis. Chocobos, awesome. Driving, could have been better. Ascension was pretty basic, could have had a lot more depth. Skills, why did this even warrant a place in the main menu? Ring mechanics, kind of meh, but could have been a lot worse. So, swiftly moving on to presentation, and if you've lasted this long, then please give yourself a big pat on the back. I'm going to kick things off with the graphical stuff and then move on to my true passion, the music. From a graphical perspective, I think we're all aware of the apparent struggles the development team had here. There were numerous articles appearing in reference to bad frame rates, and Hajime Tabit had to constantly try and allay any fears that existed around the subject, even bringing in Umbra technologies. However, I can safely say that I'm so, so glad they decided to delay the game in order to fix up all the technical issues that were plaguing it. I'm sure there are oddities that people have found, but throughout my experience with the game, I didn't notice any significant frame rate drops, and to be honest, everything looked pretty gorgeous. Numerous times I actually stopped and had to remark about how glorious Eos looked. It was a world that just felt wonderfully crafted, and if I carry on with this train of thought much longer, I'm actually going to run out of positive adjectives. I just loved how much personality there was with Eos. No matter where you went, everything felt fresh and unique, and I felt the development team should be commended for this, as I'm sure it was no easy task. Final Fantasy XV is just a good looking game in almost every aspect. My only slight disappointment was that there weren't more FMVs that had any significant meaning. I mean, I get that they clearly poured a lot of this resource into Kingsglaive, but still, I was expecting a bit more on this front. Oh, and on that note, the Kingsglaive montage to play was so bad. The same could be said for the Omen trailer too. They added nothing to the game at all, and I just felt like they were completely awkward and forced. If neither had existed, it would have actually probably been a lot better. I also didn't experience too many bugs, which was quite a relief for me. There were only a couple of times where funky things happened. For example, at one point, I approached the Imperial blockade and just didn't stop going, and it opened when it wasn't supposed to. Enemies poured out, and despite me defeating all of them, the game wouldn't recognise that I had and forced me to stay in combat mode. I could regale stories of a few more game-breaking glitches I encountered that led me to have to reload the game, but I can't imagine that would be too entertaining. Needless to say that yes, there are glitches, but to be honest, they kind of expected no more games, and it didn't bug me too much. Right, now that's out of the way, let's get on to the important stuff, the music. The soundtrack was composed by none other than Yoko Shimomura, but not many people know that she wasn't actually alone in this task. Some of the arrangements we hear throughout were actually done by other musicians such as Karo Wada, who has done a lot of arrangement work with Shimomura on Kingdom Hearts, Sachiko Miyano who has actually recently worked on World of Final Fantasy, and Yoshitaka Suzuki who was also a composer on Final Fantasy XIII Part II. I'm sure that Shimomura will get the majority of the credit, and she kind of deserves it, but there were other people that worked on the soundtrack. And I mean, there's still people that believe that Uematsu-san actually composed every single track on the Final Fantasy X soundtrack. It's just important to remember that Shimomura wasn't alone in the creation of what's an album full of stellar video game composition. And what impressed me most about it was the diversity that showcased throughout. One perfect example for me is highlighted in Chapter 9. There's a pivotal scene that takes place that's perhaps the most well-crafted in the entire game when looking at everything except maybe one of the scenes that plays directly after. But the music that plays here is a significant part to this. I'm going to keep this spoiler light, but to summarise, this scene starts with the arrival of Luna's theme, one of my favourite pieces of music on the entire soundtrack. It accompanies what can only be described as the coming of age of Noctis, and ends with the transitioning into Apocalypsis Aquarius. It's one of the sweetest transitions you will ever hear, and my god it gets you pumped out of your skin! 
I must have listened to that sequence about 10 to 15 times when I was thinking about this part of the review, and it left me in a perpetual state of goosebump. Another good example is during the exchange between Noctis and Regis at the start of the game. As soon as the piece starts to transition to Dawn, the conversation goes from reasonably jovial and playful to a deadly serious vibe, at least from Regis's perspective. It's just a shame they cut off at the crescendo instead of allowing it all to play out. So much about the soundtrack was just epic and intense, especially when it comes to battle themes. I just don't think there's any other way to describe it. I mean, when you get the chance to listen to pieces like Ravis Eterna or the intro to the music that plays when screwing off against Aranea or Loki, or even Hellfire or Magna Insomnia, you'll get what I mean. And the thing is, I could just keep on listing battle music. I mean, there's also Stand Your Ground and The Fight Is On. It's all just epic and equally diverse. Hunt or Be Hunted also deserves a special mention for featuring a booming orchestra with some rather unexpected arpeggio did synth and sequences that are so powerful that even Harry Gregson Williams and Norohiko Kabino of Metal Gear Solid thing would be sitting back in admiration. I was actually quite surprised with how much battle music is featured on their soundtrack. There's well over 10 dedicated pieces and the majority of them feel suitably unique. If I were being super picky though, my only criticism is that while they do feel epic and unique, the melodic passages can be a bit tame sometimes, but that's just me being hypercritical because I'm really clutching at straws here. I think out of all the battle tracks, Apocalypsis is my favourite, but even others like Veiled and Black deserve a special mention. Outside of battle tracks, you also have the same level of quality and diversity. I mean, it's quite impressive that you can go from masterpieces like Somnus, Dawn, Luna, and even the daytime variation of Valse di Fantastica, to pieces like A Quick Pit Stop or Relax and Reflect. I had mentioned before that I wasn't too sold on Noctis' theme when I first heard it at the Abbey Road event. However, now that I've finished the game and can see the complete transformation of Noctis as a character, I can safely say that I get it. And the fact that it plays where it does following completion of the game, it makes perfect sense to me, so... You win this round, Shimamura. I could probably talk about the music for way longer than anyone would care to listen, but I must press on. There's still the voice cast to talk about. And this was another area of the game where there seemed to be a bit of consternation, but unlike the graphical elements, I'm not sure they nailed this one dead on. It took a long time for them to announce the various cast members of Final Fantasy XV. This could have been for numerous reasons. For example, we know that some of the voice acting was changed following feedback about Noctis from Episode Dusk Guy. And as you'd expect with a game such as Final Fantasy XV, the production quality is really, really good. But I don't think it was as good as it could have been. One thing that bugged me somewhat is Noctis' voice has no distinctive quality about it. I can go back to Final Fantasy XIII or even Final Fantasy X, games where they absolutely nailed the casting and direction and instantly everyone remembers the voices that brought these characters to life. Just think about it now. It's not too hard to remember how much personality and character there was in the performances of people like Tidus, Wacker, Kamari, Seymour. Lightning, Snow, Sars, Fang, or even Caius. But with Final Fantasy XV, Noctis somewhat blended for me, and for the main character, that felt like a cardinal sin. It's unfortunate, but I felt like the performances of Adam Crowsdale as Ignis, Robbie Damon as Prompto, Chris Parson as Gladio, and Darren DePaul as Arden kind of overshadowed the performance of Ray Chase as Noctis. It was just a bit too generic. It might sound stupid, but sometimes when Noctis was taking part in the banter with the group, I had to actually look at the subtitles to figure out that it was Noctis talking. That's not just me trying to harp on Ray Chase though, I mean, the guy's awesome, he loves the franchise, and really, as you get further through the game, there are some scenes where Noctis absolutely shines. It was just more the bread and butter that I just felt was a bit underwhelming, but again, I'm kind of nitpicking here. On a positive note though, I thought that Darren DePaul's performance as Arden was stellar, it was a real standout from the game for me, and I think I'll always remember those rather quirky little quips and introductions. Izunia, Arden Izunia. The rest of the cast kind of fit with my expectations, whether it was Matt Mercer as Kor, Carrie Walgren as Aranea, or Eden Rigel as Iris, but the ancillary characters? What the hell happened to some of these? I already spoke about Dino and how the voice just doesn't really seem to work, but it's not just an issue with Dino. Viv is another example, his voice just seems way too deep, and some of the restaurant owners just don't fit either. Sanya, Taka, and Dave are decent. It's just a bit of a mixed bag, and sometimes maybe wonder if they'd actually even seen the characters they were supposed to be voicing here. Either way, as I said, I felt the voice acting as a whole had good production quality, it just could have had a bit more TLC applied to it. I just didn't like the fact that when I was hearing it, it was making me pay attention to it as opposed to just feeling natural. And with that thought expressed, it's time to move on to Lasting Appeal. The amount of stuff available to do in Final Fantasy XV is actually somewhat overwhelming, and I'm not just talking about the annoying fetch quests either, I'm talking about legitimate things to do that actually are somewhat interesting. If we negate leveling up each of the character's skills, as aside from fishing it's kind of meh, once you complete the game, there's a whole other world that opens up as you search to master the land and claim all of the legendary weapons. It's just a shame that the game doesn't really do much to push you towards any of this. Heck, even the post-game completion system is annoying. 
You've finished the game and you've overwritten your save file, but when you load it up, the game puts you right back to where you were when you finished it, as opposed to in EOS with a clue as to what you should do next. Where was the short cutscene that alludes to the fact that something is different in the world, that something has changed and you need to go and explore it and find out more about it? Even the trophies do nothing to inform you that there's a whole other world waiting for you. The only thing you might do is think about collecting the royal arms, but there's no real hint as to where these actually might be. Where were the trophies that reward you for obtaining legendary weapons or even beating the legendary bosses? Or the trophies that reward you for completing the hardest dungeons as you strive to obtain glory throughout EOS? It seems strange that in this day and age, the only reason I know about Balmung exists as a weapon is because I saw a video on YouTube about it. This kind of thing makes sense back in the olden days of Final Fantasy VII when you talk to your friends about how to get Knights of the Round or unlock those ultimate weapons, but today? It's not like I want to be spoon fed, but I'd at least like some kind of incentive. Apologies if that sounds a tad entitled. I just felt this is an area of the game that's somewhat easy to miss. Final Fantasy XV offers a ton of content, probably more than any previous Final Fantasy game, and I just wish that the game did more to highlight this to everyone. Whether it's actually completing all of those side quests, finishing off the hunts, beating the adamantoids, clearing up the imperial bases, finding the royal arms, unlocking all of Ignis's recipes, getting the legendary weapons, or completing the master dungeons, there is so much to keep you occupied. Sure, it's a little disappointing that the main campaign feels a tad short. I mean, I didn't feel like I rushed. I finished up about 50 to 60 side quests on my playthrough, but I still managed to beat the game in around 30 hours with characters in the mid 40s. But when you factor in all the time it's going to take to complete everything else this game has to offer, you're easily looking at a game that will offer well over 100 hours of gameplay, and that's nothing to stub your nose at. You can criticise this game in any other area you want, but sheer depth of content is not one of those areas. They packed it in by the boatload, and from what I can understand, the game will be receiving free updates throughout the next year to pad this out even more. For starters, there's New Game Plus, and there's even rumblings that the Yosuke Matsuda boss battle that was shown during the Mystery Disc livestream is going to be coming to the game in the future. Final Fantasy XV is here, and it's here to stay. And if you can get to the point where you've finished everything this game has to offer, even if there's no trophy to record your efforts for the world to see, you can give yourself a pat on the back, my friend, because you have damn well earned it. Okay, it's time to conclude things, so here we go. Final Fantasy XV is a game that I feel is going to be talked about for a long time. Even if Final Fantasy XVI is announced tomorrow and is due to release next year, I feel that Final Fantasy XV did enough to stand on its own two feet and stick a claim against the grand old name of Final Fantasy. So in a sense, Final Fantasy XV achieved what it set out to do. Sure, it's not perfect, and there are definitely parts that feel noticeably unfinished, but it did what it needed to do, and most importantly, despite all its deficiencies and given everything it went through, it isn't a train wreck. There was enough promise to suggest that there's still life in this old beast yet. It leaves me with confidence they can learn from this, and with the next game, apply these learnings to create something that removes all these annoying gripes and just improves everything in general. So I'll leave it as this. Final Fantasy XV is a good game. It's not a great game, but it was a game that I was satisfied with, and given the tremulous development and all its baggage it came with, I'm not sure I could really ask for more. One thing's for certain though, it is not the nail in the Final Fantasy coffin that people were predicting. It showed that there's still a lot of life left in this old gal. Okay, thanks for everyone who made it this far. It was quite a ride with this review. I didn't envision this video being quite as long when I started working on it, but there has been so much to talk about. Actually, even though this video is pretty damn long, I still feel as though there is so much more to discuss and talk about. And at this moment in time, I'm actually debating doing follow-up reviews on specific parts of the game, such as going in-depth about individual characters and the music, etc. So let me know if that's something you'd be interested in, and I'll try to work on that. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching all the way through. You guys are amazing. This is Daryl, signing out. I'll see you next time.